It's a really great pleasure to have Lars Busing as our final speaker. Lars and I were involved in this project that I talked about. And at some point, Lars came up with this crazy formula, which I still haven't understood via these <laughs> methods. Basically, like had the formula for the a particular coefficient that I care about, which it seems to be true, but I have no idea why it's true. And I was very impressed by this. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to some kind of idea of this world of going from a model to a formula. So thank you very much, Lars, for speaking to us today. Yeah, thanks for inviting me. I'm super excited to talk about symbolic regression and program induction. So I want to start off the talk by asking the question why we do data modeling in the first place. Why do machine learning? Um, and with machine learning, I mostly mean automated data modeling. And a few reasons come to mind. And one of them is uh, probably the predominant one currently in machine learning is that we are, might be interested in getting an oracle or a simulator of the computation that's specified by the data in the first place. So that sounds a little complicated, but uh, I, I think this is very actually a quite simple thing and it's uh, economically very relevant. Uh, think about the problem, uh, think about human speech. So this is uh, quite complex data. Here is a, a little diagram of one second of human speech. And just having um, an oracle or something that carries out uh, this computation of, for example, uh, computing human speech from text, um, just having that function is actually very economically relevant. And um, there's been, as you heard, of course, uh, there's been kind of like a deep learning revolution in machine learning and in the last 10 years, uh, in the last 10 years. And now it turns out that for almost all types of data that you can think about, we can actually learn pretty good function approximators that um, kind of get the statistics of this data right. And so here is, uh, and this, these two figures are taken from a um, publication of colleagues at DeepMind where they've written down a network that can actually generate uh, uh, basically extremely realistic audio from text. And um, so, and the goal of that was just simply just to distill the function that is embedded, that is described by the data of like joint uh, statistics of text and audio. And here's another example. So this is uh, slightly more recent and this is uh, already like a hint where deep learning is going. This is now a, a modeling study where um, large language models were trained jointly on image data and text data. And what you get out is a, is a model that you can show some pictures and have simple conversations with. And so I think probably like 10 years ago, this would have been like absolutely mind blowing and thinking and um, almost unimaginable that this is like so uh, close in grasp now. And so I think with respect to the first function, uh, with respect to the first objective of data modeling, um, the deep learning revolution has been like extremely impactful and to the point where people claim now that if you have a lot of, if you have enough data to, to describe the computation that you're interested in, you can actually find a function approximator that will this carry out with very high fidelity. And I think that is not entirely true, but we're really, really getting there. However, um, there's also like a second reason for why we often want to do um, data modeling. And that is a, a somewhat or orthogonal objective that is namely to help human understanding of the underlying phenomenon that's described by the data. Um, and here is a, an example is, for example, econometrics or material science or biology. Um, in, in these um, uh, fields, we often have problems where we have data about a phenomenon and modeling that is not just to um, have a simulation of this phenomenon, but also to understand the underlying constituents and the underlying ingredients that make up this phenomenon and their interactions in order to understand it better and to describe it better. And modeling can be very helpful for that. So now the question, has actually deep learning helped in, in this, uh, with respect to this objective of data modeling as much? And I would argue probably with, uh, in, um, uh, in agreement with others that this is, has been, there's been much less progress. And the main reason for that is that deep learning models are often quite uninterpretable in themselves. So here is a neural network or a wiring diagram of, a, of a, the sta state of the art neural network model called the transformer. And 
there's a, a bunch of little blocks uh, shown here that are parts of the model, but there are incredibly many parts of models. And so here's just like one little snippet and often modern neural network models have, have this wired wiring diagram repeated hundreds of times on top, top of each other and with often with hundreds of billions of real value parameters. And so now if you're interested in understanding a um, phenomenon and model it with a deep neural network, it's then almost um, uh, unintelligible in itself. And so, um, and I invite you to compare this to uh, a class of da data models that you're probably much more familiar with um, than me, um, namely by models, um, for example, in standard physics, um, which are represented by formulae. So here's the famous set of Maxwell's equations. <clears throat> and this is probably like a, um, one of the most successful approaches of data modeling um, and giving really rise to deep understanding of the undervalued phenomenon. And the key to why we think there, in my opinion, why we think there is an underlying phenomena is that this is a very compact, compressed representation of a lot of knowledge. Obviously, you need some background knowledge to interpret these symbols, but still the model itself is very compact. But, uh, um, but mostly also is that this model identifies underlying constituents, underlying parts, for example, the electric and the magnetic field, and their interaction. And so this having this kind of like this fine grained um, decomposition of, of, of some data into parts and how and their interaction gives us an, a feeling of really profound understanding. So, um, I, so with that, I would argue maybe we are not there with deep learning. And so this talk is about uh, then can we try to push forward maybe uh, machine learning helping uh, towards the second uh, objective of uh, data modeling that I listed here towards human understanding. And by, by doing machine learning, not with deep learning models, but with um, formulae, for example, or more symbolic expressions that describe data. And this is the, the subfield in machine learning that's called symbolic regression, and that's what the talk is about. Okay, so having motivated slightly why I think symbolic regression could be um, very impactful, um, um, here's a little outline of my talk. In, initially, I will give a, um, a little bit more formal definition of what I mean with symbolic regression, and then we'll go into, in the second part, into how we actually solve the resulting symbolic regression problem. How do we solve symbolic regression given some data? And then in the end, I'll leave you with some practical considerations of if you, if you're adventurous enough and feel that you want to use these methods in practice, and maybe a couple of pointers there to the literature. All right, so uh, let's get started. So. Um, by now, you're probably um, well aware of the definition of a standard regression problem, and I'm just uh, recapping that very briefly so we have a bit of, little bit of shared notation. Um, and so uh, in a regression problem, I assume that we are given um, inputs, or I also want to call those features. Um, I'm going to assume that they're all real valued for the sake of simplicity now, um, and there I have a D of those features. And associated with these features is an output or a target. Uh, that's the modeling target that I want to model. And, um, and I've given a concrete data set of pairs of features and targets. Um, so this N here is it's not a power. It's, it's a superscript just to denoting the different data points in my data set. So um, in order to define how well, I'm matching the desired uh, target with a prediction y hat. I need I need some kind of loss function, which is a, a often like a real valued function that tells me how close my predicted target is to my um, uh, to my true target. And given that, I can define how good a candidate solution for a regression problem is. So a candidate solution here is just a mapping from inputs to outputs. And I can, and I'm, I'm saying there's a loss, I'm defining a loss now for this function f. And I'm saying this is just the sum over all the data points um, of the loss, how, how well each individual prediction is matching the output over the entire data set. Okay, so this is all very standard, box standard um, 
so far. Uh, and now the obvious task is to find such a function that describes my data well in this sense. Okay. And now the only difference between standard regression and symbolic regression is the set of functions f that this optimization ranges over. So, which I want to call here capital F. So basically, so we want to find a function ranging in this uh, set over uh, admissible models in a sense that um, minimizes or approximately minimizes um, the minimum over this loss function. So, um, okay, so now is a, the next task is obviously, so what should the set F of functions be that we use for a symbolic regression? So, um, and in comparison, that was all always in, like, in deep learning, for example, that's, this, that's a parametric set of models that's parameterized by weights of a neural network, for example, excuse me. So uh, essentially the task now is we want to define this search space uh, F over functions that we search over. So, and a common approach is to define this based on a set of underlying primitives, which I want to call P. So, um, which is just a set of functions PI um, uh, that maps some um, AI dimensional real valued inputs to uh, real valued outputs. And maybe I'm adding here a token uh, NAN, not a number to define or to, to model that somehow maybe the function is not defined on a, on a particular set of inputs. And so AI here is what I also call the arity <clears throat> of this function. And um, you could think about a very simple example set of primitives given by, for example, uh, plus here, uh, denoting the sum of two real valued val uh, variables times, uh, these are all binary functions. And then we have unary functions, for example, the sine or the expo uh, exponential function. So, so given the set of primitives now, I want to define my set of uh, formulae that I search over as somehow all the combinations of these elementary functions um, um, yeah, the set of, of terms that I can somehow write down with by combining these elementary or these primitive functions. And so I'm writing this down here in this um, computer science notation where I say um, F, which is a meta variable that ranges over all possible formulae, any formulae F can either be written as an input feature itself, so um, which is kind of like the identity function um, for my input to my output, or I, um, a formula is given by the output of one of these primitives applied to other terms f. So this f does not refer to the same formula. It's just like ranging over the set of formula. So right. So so this defines essentially the set of inductively constructed functions um, built from these primitives. Um, or equivalently, I could write this down as uh, I could model these um, the set of functions as uh, rooted trees, where an, an internal node of the tree is is a primitive, <clears throat> and the inputs to this primitive are just represented by the children in this tree, and the leaves of the trees are just the input features, and so in a sense, this describes what's often called a computation graph of the function. Um, where you can compute the function from basically from evaluating the leaves and then you evaluate uh, levels higher up. And then once you're at the root, you have the output of the function. So these, these notations or models of functions are uh, equivalent for me, uh, for, the, for the talk right now. Sorry, um, okay. just a quick question. Um, yes, would, you, um, would you tend to you know, put constants into these primitives like so you can get all linear combinations of things? Uh, uh, that, that's a fantastic question. I will very briefly dip into that question later on, or address this question. Um, so yeah, uh, hold, hold that thought. Uh, I'll try to address it later. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Now, um, with this definition of the set of functions, um, symbolic regression is now basically just like f solve this optimization problem. Um, and now, <clears throat> uh, and this is where the real trouble starts. Um, if you model, if you, if you only, uh, or like only, but um, it turned out in the last uh, 10 years that um, we can actually learn gigantically high dimensional uh, functions, neural networks, based on gradient descent. 
And so, um, as, you, as you might all know, so basically taking gradients of the loss with respect to parameters has been turned, turned out to be like an incredibly powerful tool for, for solving similar optimization problems. However, because this problem essentially ranges over a discrete set, we actually don't have derivatives in this, in this, uh, in this case. So somehow this transforms this relatively benign, well understood optimization problem now from, it, from deep learning into something that's extremely hard um, and is kind of like a combinatorial search problem that can get as difficult as, um, as you want it to be. Um, and so just to give you a feeling for why this is so, um, uh, so different, uh, this optimization problem. So assume you have a function F0, a candidate solution, and you can evaluate it with a loss. So here, this is 0 0.3, for example. In deep, um, so with backprop, you would automatically get a direction of improvement to find a better candidate solution. So now in this other search space of over discrete formulae, you don't have that. In order to get a better candidate, you actually have to search for a better solution, approximate solution. And um, so that means you have to kind of like trial and error, uh, propose new candidates, evaluate those. And that means that you can also uh, uh, stumble into worse candidate solutions. And you have to try again until you find something that's actually slightly better in order to improve your overall loss. So this is kind of like the difference between discrete optimization problems and kind of smooth um, optimization problems. Uh, so, and the next uh, problem is that the search space can um, grow extremely fast with the uh, with the length of formula that you're willing to consider, right? Um, so it kind of like grows exponentially fast. And so these make all ingredients for a really complicated search problem, which is the underlying um, kind of like bread and, uh, uh, props research problem in symbolic regression. And so before, uh, and so like just uh, before I actually tell you or give you a, a feel of the lay of the land of how current research methods try to approximate solutions to this problem, let me try to um, reiterate a little bit or uh, give you another wrinkle to what we mean when we want to solve a symbolic regression problem. And to, in order to specify that a little bit further, we have to talk about complexity, accu uh, complexity accuracy trade-off. So you might have encountered this phenomenon already in previous machine learning lectures um, um, under the moniker of um, overfitting, for example. So um, to illustrate this, um, let me give you a super simple example. So assume you have a one-dimensional input feature and a one-dimensional output feature, which I uh, plot down here as the x and the y-axis. And so you have, you, you're given a bunch of data points in red. And um, a first guess of how to model this data might be, OK, you just put a linear function through this. Now, um, obviously, this leaves uh, something to be desired because there's a lot of variability in the data that you don't capture with a simple function. And you could be a little bit more ambitious. And here's a function that's obviously matches the data much better. Um, so it goes almost to all the points, but there's still some points that are a little bit off. And uh, well, it turns out that you can actually go get, of course, a function that goes through all of the points exactly. And that's just a polynomial of the degree given by the number of data points, right? But obviously, there's something undesirable about the solution on the right hand side because it seems to be like a very idiosyncratic solution to this problem. And so this is what I mean, is that we have to address at some point a complexity accuracy trade-off. We, we have to tell our search algorithm at some point, don't try to make the formula better. You have to kind of take into account that I'm not OK with two comp overly complex solutions to this problem. And one way, um, there are two ways of dealing with this. One way um, is that we have to regularize the problem in machine learning language. And here, often what it's done in symbolic regression land is that we modify our loss function. And um, so I've written a modified loss down here, where um, on top of the data modeling term in the front that measures how good our function is, we often add a second term that penalizes the complexity of the underlying function with the parameter lambda that tells us how much we want to trade off the complexity of the function versus fit. So this is one way of dealing with it. So we always, if we think about symbolic regression, we always have to either think about penalizing form complexity as such as this, 
or there's a second way of dealing with it, and namely that's basically keeping track of an entire Pareto front of solutions um, for your problem. And here is um, here is a plot of a real world study in material science where they used symbolic regression. And um, focus maybe on the on the plot on the left hand side first. Here, what they've done is they directly show the Pareto front over solutions that they found on their real world data. And here, uh, the x-axis denotes the complexity of the functions they look at. And the y-axis is the error of the function. Um, and so obviously, functions to the bottom left are desirable because these would be compact, short uh, formulae with uh, little error. And so, but here you get a Pareto front in a sense. Uh, and the, on the left hand side shows you uh, the, the concrete equations that they've uh, marked down in this. And so, so this is another way of dealing with this complexity accuracy trade off. Basically, just try to um, keep track of a whole Pareto front. And there are a bunch of methods I will name later that uh, make use of this. Okay, so now with this in mind, let's actually go to the um, uh, meat of symbolic regression. How do we solve the uh, arising symbolic regression problems? And so this is, these are basically dealing with search methods for finding this um, approximate minima of our loss function. And so in general, here's a, the, um, basically the um, most coarse grained taxonomy of search methods for this type of problem that I could think of. And um, so search methods fall into one of two cat uh, categories, or almost all. Namely, they are incomplete and they are complete search methods. So the incomplete methods that I also call often stochastic search methods, they um, work by proposing a formula and then uh, perturbing this formula locally a little bit until they find a formula that's good enough. So essentially, so you have to, um, and I'll discuss this in a little bit more detail, ver whereas complete search methods more systematically enumerate the space of the functions that you consider. And often complete search methods come with some sort of guarantee of that you will never miss um, a function in the limit of infinite complex, uh, infinite uh, compute budget, whereas incomplete search methods often do not have any formal guarantees but they happen to be quite fast in practice. So um, let me give you a flavor of what uh, standard incomplete and stochastic search methods look like. Um, so uh, the main grandfather algorithm of all of these methods is called simulated annealing. This is an algorithm that's been around for um, decades. It's been uh, used in physics and all other, and, and engineering as well. And so this is the, basically the archetypal uh, local, inc uh, local incomplete search method. And it proceeds in the following way. Um, so we define an initial formula F1. That can be anything that you can write down. And so, um, um, and here I, I, on the top left, I plotted a little bit, or I tried to symbolically represent a uh, formula uh, at some point FK, which is like this, a little bit, this incomplete tree here. And um, we, on top of our initial formula, we also define a set of transition rules, R or RI, which, um, which are just maps from formulae to formulae, right? And we have, a, uh, we have a whole set of those. And one example for a transition rule is, is here that I uh, show you now is basically often uh, transition rules make local perturbations in those functions. And for example, here is a standard local perturbation in used in symbolic regression is um, that transforms this formula FK on top here to the formula FK plus one is take a leaf. Um, here's the leaf XN, delete that leaf and replace it with a subtree that's randomly generated in some shape or form. And so basically you delete egg. And so obviously this formula has still something in common with the previous formula. It still shares the, the rest of the tree, but it has a, a subtree that was switched out against something that was randomly generated. And so now this is just one example of a transition rule. And obviously you want to somehow have a rich enough set of transition rules that you can possibly reach all set of formula that you're interested in. 
right? So now um, standard local search or stochastic search um, then iterates over this process of taking picking a formula, uh, randomly choosing um, one of your transition rules, then applying this transition rule, get a new formula out, and then evaluate this new formula against your data. See how good is it's a better solution or not. And then in the last step, this is very important, we accept or reject this local search move. So obviously, if we created a way worse formula, we don't want to actually uh, then iterate from this formula on. And so that means we reject it and or we can accept this. And so there are a bazillion ways on algorithms, instantiations of this algorithmic pattern that um, propose particular accept and reject rules, particular um, uh, definition of transition rules. So there's a whole literature over these methods. And depending on how you design these, you can get algorithms with quite different characteristics. So um, standard simulated annealing, for example, has a temperature parameter that uh, ra ramps down or decays over the, uh, over the search. Like the more you search, the smaller is this temperature parameter. And um, depending on this temperature parameter, you're more likely to reject base uh, bad um, solutions. So in the end, you become relatively greedy to home in on a locally optimal uh, rule. But there are also accept and reject a schema to, uh, that lead, uh, lead you to Bayesian algorithms, where you get guarantees that the stochastic process of generating local formula um, samples from a predefined uh, probabilistic distribution that you might be interested in. Okay, so um, now I want to uh, tell you the most famous, at least in symbolic regression land, um, a variant of local search algorithms. And these are uh, genetic algorithms, or GAs here for short. This is a, a family of black box optimization algorithms based on this local search algorithm of the idea of local search. And um, it's also an iterative algorithm that iterates over random, randomly perturbing formulae. But it has uh, one uh, innovation in it, um, namely that instead of having a single solution or a single candidate solution for our symbolic regression problem, um, genetic algorithms actually keep track of an entire family of um, functions, of a, of a set of functions. This could, for example, could be a Pareto front, as we discussed earlier. So formulae of different complexity, but it can also be um, um, a set that's differently defined. And now um, what these algorithms do is they, as I, they also have transition rules uh, that get applied to um, formulae. And then we try to kind of like locally perturb these formula and see if we get better ones and then add these to the set of uh, formula that we already have. So, but here one um, innovation is that also we don't only look at um, transition rules or perturbation rules that take single formula, but we look at so-called crossover um, rules that take pairs of formula and then try to somehow combine them to get solutions that have characteristics of um, both parents in a sense. So they are here, the, the, that's where the name comes from, right? It's kind of like um, genetics in, in biology, you, you pick pairs of um, of candidate solutions and try to somehow combine them. And this can be, for example, this is often done in practice by copy, copying subtrees from one formula to another, uh, to another formula and then evaluating these candidate solutions. And so this defines a richer set of uh, perturbations. And so these algorithms throw these richer set of perturbations at the set of formulae, generate new formulae, evaluate those against the data. And then if we found something good, add this to the solution set as before. And so, and then this algorithm iterates, iterates, iterates until we meet a um, termination criterion that could, for example, be a, um, a criterion on the error of the best solution, or if we run out of search budget. Um, so um, there are obviously a lot of kind of algorithmic design choices um, for designing a concrete uh, genetic algorithm for this problem. And so there's a whole literature of this. This has a quite long tradition in symbolic regression that goes maybe back like about 20, 30 years. And so this is probably the, 
the most popular set of search algorithms that um, are available for symbolic regression now. And chances are that if you want to use these methods in practice, that you might consider one of those methods. And at the end, I have a list of references that give you concrete pointers to software packages uh, that are out there that implement these uh, search algorithms. OK, so um, let's look at the other side of uh, search methods, uh, now the complete search methods. So um, they, for, a long, for the longest time in symbolic regression, they were actually not competitive with incomplete stochastic search methods. But recent developments have them made more competitive. So I think it's worthwhile to just like go through them very uh, briefly and see what advantages and disadvantages they have over uh, incomplete search methods. So here the archetypal algorithm that I uh, want to use for describing complete search methods is what I want to call best first search, BFS. So this is slightly, uh, um, uh, this is like a slight name overloading. Sometimes you read BFS as breadth first search. That's not what I mean here. I mean best first search. It's also a classical algorithm in uh, AI. And here the, the strategy of solving this optimization problem is very different. So um, in particular, what we do is um, we want to model partial formulae. We want to, um, and what I mean with partial formulae is a formula that has, that looks just like a formula, but where there are sub formulas that I have not, have not yet specified. For example, think about the formula uh, and in order to do that, we introduce a special symbol, which we call obligation. That's just a question mark. And we add this to our grammar over uh, for generating formula. And so this, as I said, models partial formula. And for example, an example is here, sine of question mark times x plus question mark. That just means that's a partial formula. I'm pretty sure it should be a sign, but I don't know of what. So I, and I can model this unknown sub formula as a question mark. And here I have, I'm sure I have to add something, but that's still unknown. I haven't determined what I want to add. So I'm just going to put a placeholder, a question mark here. Okay. So these question marks, again, don't refer to a same concrete formula. They're kind of like meta variables that range over the set of formula. So now the search strategy is to start from a question mark. That means I have no idea what this formula B is, and then replace this question mark by, by iteratively applying our grammar construction rules to build an entire search tree over all possible formulae. So what do I mean with this? A little bit more concrete. Here is a question mark that just denotes the set of all possible formula. Well, what could the set of all possible formula be? Well, based on our grammar and of our, uh, uh, how we decide, define formula, there can only be a, a finite number of what uh, the top level looks like. And here's for a, and here uh, that means I replace my question mark by all possible in all possible ways that my grammar admits. And um, if I just have one input feature and I just have one primitive, the multiplication. This is what my search tree would look like after one iteration. I replace the question mark in all possible ways. Well, it, a formula could either be just the input feature x1, I'm assuming there's only one, or it could be a multiplication between two unknown things. And so that's here the other branch of the search tree. And now, once I hit a complete formula in this search method, here x1 is a complete formula, it does not have a question mark in it. I evaluate it against data. So, um, so I basically take my x1. That's the first proposed complete formula. I, I uh, evaluate against data, and I see how good that does. So obviously, I'm not done yet, right? Because there are still uh, formula that haven't been expanded. So what I do is I pick a leaf in the search tree that still has uh, question marks in it. And I take one question mark and I replace it again iteratively with all pos in all possible ways. And so what that what would that be in this case? Well, there's only one formula I still haven't operated on. It's this one. And I take the first question mark, for example, and I replace it in all possible ways. Well, what could this first question mark be? It could only be the input feature, or it could only be another multiplication. 
And so you see that we have to play this game iteratively uh, go along. And this kind of, and um, this builds uh, inductively the set of all possible formula. And so now at this point um, that I'm iterating, there's actually an interesting choice to be made. Which formula? So now I have two leaves that still are incomplete. And now it, there's an important decision, which branch of the search tree do I look at first? So uh, if I don't know anything about my problem, right, uh, it, it doesn't matter. Uh, I don't know what the solution is. Let me pick left or right. But actually, um, depending on what the pick is, the, um, uh, it really de determines of how quickly I find my solution. So ideally, I would leverage some kind of side information that tells me which branch should I iterate in first. So that's what the role of a search heuristic is. A search heuristic age is a ranking function that tells me which of these possible candidates should I look at first. Um, and depend and so it, it ranks different uh, uh, formula in my in my search tree. That's um, and I take the highest scoring formula to uh, iterate over next. Okay. So as I said, and obviously the cost um, or the time to find a solution is determined by the what I call the quality of this ranking function. Like how good is this ranking function in 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 characterizing or in sniffing out promising branches in my uh, search tree. And for the longest time in AI, um, people have hand designed such uh, search heuristics, such ranking functions. Basically, given by my knowledge about the problem, can I somehow write down a function h such that if I use this for search, I get, um, I get my solutions very quickly. Now, this has not been very successful. And so that's why genetic algorithms were often the dominant algorithms in the field, because it's actually really difficult to write down a search heuristic that uh, gives you uh, good performance. Now, here um, is where a, another revolution in, um, uh, in AI and machine learning in the last 10 years comes to help. Uh, and that's a lesson that's learned from um, Playing computer Lars. games. Lars, yeah. can I just ask you for the previous slide quickly? Um, Absolutely, please. Yeah. So, I mean, this is some kind of a groundhog day kind of approach. I mean, what if you pick in the first line, say, I pick that function, you know, sine question mark times x1 plus question mark, you somehow made a heuristic age decision in some sense, saying, this is what I'm looking for. Isn't that what you're doing now there as well? You somehow now rank something and said, I'm gonna now stick to that branch in my in my iteration, in my trees, because now you know I'm 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 favoring one over the other. I mean it's basically like that that what you have done at the very beginning is basically what you do a few steps further down the tree again, in some sense like that, when you pick that. Am I right in that kind of interpretation? Um so there are multiple decisions that you make at every step of the algorithm. That's very, yes, absolutely. And every time when you have a decision of where to expand next, you call this function h. And it depends on if the, some, it depends on what context do you give uh, to the function in order to make that decision, right? So you could, mm -hmm. you could say, I'm only looking, it can only look at the question mark and then decide how to replace that question mark. That would mean that a decision somewhere down in the search tree would look very much like a repeated decision that it made already somewhere. And so mm -hmm. that it would be a very kind of like very myopic contextless decision to be made. But um, a, a search heuristic can look at, for example, at the entire prefix or the entire path to the, to the node that we make a current decision at. And so it might actually take into account all the previous decisions that it had has made. Um, so that's also admissible. But Does that answer I mean, your question? I just mean maybe even be talking about the same thing. I'm saying just think of that that formula in your first line is basically uh, on the top of your tree, in some sense. You know, I'm saying so. You, you just showed me a snippet of the whole process, but I'm just asking like, how, how is the first decision made? Uh, of writing down that first formula, basically. So 
is there a different a different uh, algorithm which picks the the first best uh, the best first basically like that. Ah, okay sorry sorry i misunderstood uh, so <laughs> yeah. this uh, the first line in the slide is just a example of what i mean with partial formula i don't i do not take this as a starting step um, for my search necessarily so the algorithm in in its most general form just picks a question mark without any further context and it just oh, says okay like, uh, apologies for this uh, confusion. Yeah. No, no, I was just thought that you basically, I mean, which makes sense as well as just thinking, suppose somewhere in the, in the, I found that first part, now I'll continue to, to resolve the other question marks in some sense. So I, I think there are, there are actually uh, algorithms that do this. And so mm -hmm. often this is called like a sketch. This is basically like an idea of what you, uh, but this has to be somewhat user provided and there's no clear way of, you, providing that in the first place. We have to assume more in the sense that we also know something about the solution. But like, yeah, so that, that's possible as well, yeah. Yeah, and is there, I mean, which probably relates to that. So your, your cost function or a loss function, I mean, that basically you have to determine some of like what, what your weights are on your on your set F basically like that. So what, you make some kind of a decision, I assume like saying, well, I, I put yes. more weights on you for that, as you said before, because I don't want to over, you know, get crazy overfitting or something like that, which uh, I would like to. Yes, avoid. yes. These these are all design choices that can you can where you can put prior knowledge about the problem at hand into the algorithm. That's exactly right. So if you know, for example, like I, my function, the the thing that I'm looking for is very likely to contain the exponential function. Then I then I obviously want to rank these these search nodes higher than others because then i preferentially expand those this is a, this, yeah there is a lot of design decisions for shaping what the algorithm is yeah okay thanks lots uh, thanks for your question so coming back to the point of how to design a good search heuristic that basically uh leads me good solutions and so historically this has been uh, done in the literature mostly by hand designing those um, which hasn't been very successful because it's like, it turned out there is no general applicable, people couldn't write down generally applicable, very good search heuristic that work for uh, agnostically for many, many problems. So, um, but actually it turned out in the last 10 years, people uh, uh, learned an important lesson. And that is, uh, that lesson was first uh, learned in the, in the subfield of machine learning for games and namely, the lesson was that oh is we can learn to search so um here's a very uh ex this is taken from a very um these two images from a very uh, famous proponent of this approach which it was the AlphaGo paper uh from DeepMind is where they build an a system that can play go very efficiently and obviously a game of go you can you can visualize that or formalize that as a uh a tree search problem, right? Like there are finitely many positions in, in a game of Go. And if I could search uh, long enough in this, in this search tree, I could solve the opt I could find the optimal strategy to beat any opponent or at least to play, uh, to play the Nash. But the search space is way too big. And so you'll never make any re reasonable headway by blindly expanding the search tree and systematically searching it. And so here, the lesson that was learned is that you can learn a neural network, you can learn a function approximator that does not give you the solution directly, but that learns to rank where in the search tree you should look next. And so that was basically the key to uh, designing much, much stronger artificial intelligence game engines for chess, Go, and other computer games. Yeah, so that's the, the moniker is basically, instead of trying to spit out the solution directly, train a neural network that uh, learns to rank the branches of the search tree such that you, if you search with this search heuristic, you will get a quicker uh, path to a solution. So um, an in instantiation of this idea in the land of symbolic regression is what is often called neurally guided breadth for, uh, best first search. So it's neurally guided because the neural network now tells you what the best candidate sol uh, solution branch should be, and you search first in these branches. So what would a neural network look like that 
um, you could use for um, neurally guided best first search for symbolic regression. It would be something. So here's a here's just a schemata of a of a neural network that um, of the inputs and the outputs. It would basically take into account the data that uh, you want to model in the first place, and it would uh, take into account the the formula uh, or of which uh, a question mark you're trying to replace currently, right? Right, or or at least uh, a formula that you're trying to rank. And so you take this, this information, you feed it into the neural network, and you train it such that it gives you a good uh, uh, ranking over uh, these candidate uh, branches of your search tree. I know this is very much from a bird's eye uh, point of view, but um, this is essentially uh, how more complete search methods now nowadays work. Instead of trying to exactly um, build a search algorithm that has a, a predefined search order that you write down, you actually train a neural network that guides this uh, kind of search towards pockets in your search space that are promising. OK, so unfortunately, I'm really running very late. Um, so I have to speed up through this. But here is to close the loop but, um, to something that we talked about earlier question. How do you deal with numeric constants? So now I told you, like, OK, how to search or functions and stuff like this. But often you want numeric constants, for example, to take linear combinations or something like this. So one a way of dealing with this, and that's the current state of the art, is to extend your grammar by another symbol that you call C, which is just a placeholder for any numerical constant that you want. And then you can generate formula with this uh, special uh, placeholder C in it. And so <clears throat> effectively, what you then do is that you do a bi-level search. You search over your formula that has these anonymous constants in it. And once you find a candidate solution you uh, that has still these unresolved uh, symbolic constants in it, and then you fit those to the data using standard um, numerical solution methods, for example, uh, gradient-based solutions. So I hope that um, makes sense. Please let me know if, if there's still questions with respect to the, these numerical constants. I'm sorry, um, yeah, one, one question about um, yeah. capital K. Are, are you going to penalize capital K as well? That's a fantastic question. So, so capital K cat is already implicitly penalized because you often penalize the length of the formula itself. And so, for example, and each constant counts, for example, one towards the length of uh, the thing. But there are other penalization schemes around that make extra, that come up with extra penalization terms. Um, uh, and those go under the name of um, Bayesian information criteria, basically. Because somehow, like a constant gives you more than just one, uh, the modeling power of one, because it basically, you still fit it. It's still an undetermined uh, set of constants, essentially. So uh, yes, there are different penalization schemes. And last, sorry. Yes. <laughs> Would it make more sense to start without the parameters and then afterwards, after you pick based like a functional type and then just see as usual, you know, within the parameter space like we're going to find? Or is it, I mean, it, because it's also a cost, you know, question, obviously, like that to add on all the Cs. So I've, I've seen, I've seen multiple instantiation and I've seen what you suggest as well. So where, mm -hmm. um, people search over formulae without numerical constants, and then they decorate for each term, they um, uh, decorate that with a uh, multiplicative and addition, an additive constants, and then fit okay. those afterwards. So that's also possible. Here's one way of dealing it. It is basically to explicitly add them during the search, but not as numerical values, but as placeholders, and then fit them later. So bo both, are, okay. both are possible. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so in the last um, maybe few minutes, let me just give you a feel of like what are these methods capable uh, of. And so I'm going to show um, just an image from a recent uh, survey uh, that compares symbolic regression methods against each other. And so uh, they, the survey is run on a standard benchmark set. And 
part of this benchmark set is are equations such as this that you will see here. These are equations extracted from Feynman's, uh, from the Feynman lectures, Feynman, uh, Feynman's very um, famous uh, physics 101 uh, uh, lectures. And here you see just like a lot of physical equations. Um, and so this is the type of complexity that at most you can expect your symbolic regression method to manage. So um, we're talking here about maybe tens of symbols or something like this. Like you will never find a formula that's 20 uh, symbols long. That's without side information, that's absolutely intractable with current methods. You have to know if you want to, if you hope for finding something more ambitious, you have to assume something in particular about your search problem. So this is just like a, to give you a flavor of what um, is currently reachable with these methods. Um, here's a comparison of many, many methods um, with respect to three uh, different um, criterion. So they are ordered. So here on the y-axis, you see different uh, acronyms. These are all different uh, symbolic regression methods. And they are sorted by mean accuracy on this benchmark set of which I showed you a couple of examples. So the second criterion for um, for the search methods that you were compared against were is formula complexity, right? This is the uh, remember this is the accuracy complexity trade-off that I talked about. How complex are the formulae that these methods found, and how long did it take to find this particular formula, the solution, the best solution? So, and here I just want to point out that the top three methods are all genetic programming methods. So, and you can see that they are give very accurate solutions. They um, give, they can give um, ranging from relatively medium to slightly longer formulae. But in, in particular, what's striking is that they're uh, that this uh, search time, the solution time, is very, very long. So these methods, basically, these genetic methods have to search for a very, very long time in order to find a candidate solution. Whereas here, this, this, uh, <laughs> the third method, that's a very recent development that's taken from this paper that you see on the bottom here, where, and that's a new neurally guided breadth, uh, best first search. So that's a, a complete search method. And what you can see here is that it's almost on par uh, in terms of accuracy with respect to genetic programming methods. It finds slightly more compact formulae for uh, the same problem, but it's much, much faster to actually solve any given search problem. And that is because these methods use these trained neural networks to guide you through this big search tree. And so, um, that saves you a lot of computation time when you actually apply these methods to find a new uh, symbolic regression task. Okay, so unfortunately, I don't have time um, to go through all of these, but um, uh, all the, the remaining points, but I just want to leave you with maybe two or three points of, um, of um, expectation management advice. So uh, given that, so symbolic regression is a much smaller subfield in machine learning than other fields, for example, deep learning. So there's a lot of, um, there's much less hardened re, uh, in industry strength solution to these problems. They are still somewhat seen as exotic search methods. So that should tell you that you have to be willing to tweak um, these methods and play with them in order to get, um, uh, in order to apply them to your problem. Um, so they're much less out of the box. Um, as I said, they can only find solutions with short description length because the set of formula really grows super, super fast the longer formula you try to look at. And um, in particular, the problem that you look at should be low dimensional. Somehow you only want to allow for a small number of input features of your regression problem. Whereas deep learning methods, they can deal with tens of hundreds of thousands of features quite effortlessly. Symbolic regression methods are very, very sensitive to the number of features that you feed into them because the number of formulae in your search space grows polynomially with respect to the num uh, with as a function of the numbers of features that you have. And so your 
um, my advice would be if you want to use symbolic regression methods in your research, pre-select the, the features that you really, really care about and really want um, using other machine learning techniques and then use symbolic regression. Okay, so um, I didn't actually get into uh, program induction as the title promised, but I'm very sorry about this, but like just leave you with a, with a note that searching for formulae uh, um, kind of like can be generalized into searching over algorithms and programs. And so this is a very natural generalization of uh, formulae. And the resulting problem that you get would be then called a program induction problem. Okay, so here, uh, here's a list of references that help you maybe to uh, as pointers to the literature. So the first one is a in-depth um, review of current symbolic regression methods and a comparison. And um, then just a list of other notable approaches in this field. Okay, uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Lars, for this beautiful talk. Are there questions? But actually, I have a question. Suppose, as you said, you can only go to a certain number within the formula, but is there anything in there which actually uses mathematical pre-knowledge like in, a, in an algorithmic way to, to make uh, decisions in that context? You know, not, not just going through the tree as symbols of, you know, but saying, well, obviously I must look, you know, for, for the fifth function and not for the sixth or something like that. So the only thing I've seen in this respect is that candidate solutions were looked at, uh, the asymptotics of potential candidates were looked at. And if you know that the asymptotics of the function that you propose is not matches maybe some side information that you have about the problem, then you can mm -hmm. safely ignore those, right? If I know that, oh, my solution should be well behaved uh, as X goes to infinity, but oh, the solution that I'm proposing is crazy in this respect, then I can, uh, I've seen that type of information being leveraged, nothing else so far. So I think there's actually a good deal of potential mathematical knowledge that you can bring to bear in order to uh, kind of prune down the search space even more. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, I just had a question about um, your slide on the transition rules. Um, it was yeah. sort of near the start of the talk somewhat, the way that you were choosing like FK plus one. Yeah, so I was just wondering, like, can you sort of think about this as kind of like a gradient descent thing? Like, you, you're talking about accepting or rejecting FK plus one, but could you kind of just do every transition rule and then choose the best one at each stage? Would that be a common way to, to do this part? Or So that's one way you could possibly do that. Um, but obviously, there's a computational cost to that, right? And so now you pay a, a larger cost by applying all transition operators and it has just been shown that, or like it turns out empirically that it's not worth doing that. It's often worth doing just one and testing and then randomly picking another one. But it, it, this would be possible, but it's it's just an empirical question what works better. Okay, so so how big should you think the set of transition rules normally is, if that's a well-defined question? Like, is it huge? Yeah, often it's a parametric class of transition rules. So a transition rule depends on the set of primitives that you give it. For example, here, right, I say I replace a subtree with, a, with another subtree and uh, that uh, how many subtrees there are that can, be, uh, can replace the initial subtree depends on the, your grammar size. And it depends on, for example, like how deep your tree is anyways. But like usually there are, let, let's say maybe just a handful of uh, families of transition rules, for example, uh, delete a subtree, um, randomly huh. add a newly generated subtree, or prune some other aspects. And so usually there's a handful of these high level families of search rules. Right. Okay. Okay. But within the families, it's not continuous. So you can't do any kind of gradient descent. It's going to be exactly. Going to be exactly. Continuous. That's right. Yeah. That's right. So it's in that sense, it's a, like in essence, it's a discrete problem. Yeah. You have to, okay. unfortunately Thanks. really try what you, what you try to do and then get feedback from that. Can I ask you last, do I may I misunderstand it? Although you have uh, a discrete, you know, value for the gradient descent, could you think of it like that's a discretization of a continuous, you know, like landscape, and you could use that for your for your search? So I I don't know of any particular study that has applied that to symbolic regression specifically. There has been a little bit of trying to embed discrete search problems into continuous spaces and then do gradient descent in continuous spaces and then project the solutions back. And that really depends if that works, 
really depends on the nature of your search problem itself. So for some, it actually turns out that this that embedding that into a uh, into a continuous space and then doing gradient search there turns out to work. Um, but for some others, it does not. Um, so for example, yeah, that's all I can say. I don't I, I don't have a good example for this, but it can or it cannot help uh, depending on your application. Yeah. And, and one final question for me, actually, which comes back to the end. So why did you guys choose the complete method over the incomplete stochastic one in, in, in your, uh, I mean, because you almost mentioned like some kind of, actually people don't do that uh, just recently. So it seems like because of, uh, I mean, what's the advantage from your point of view that you chose it? <clears throat> oh, I, I want to clear up a misunderstanding. So this is not my study that's uh, uh, written as ours, unfortunately. Oh, that, no, that's ours just... in the same. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, that's 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 just an example out of the literature. So okay. I so why complete search methods attractive is because you kind of get guarantees that you in some sense never miss a solution uh, if you somehow control your search heuristic. And as we see, they they can be much faster. Sorry, does it enhance that you have like your pre-selection down in the tree in some sense like that? Does it help in that yes, context? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. That's that's essentially where the speed up gains come from. Yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Alex, I've, I've got some questions. Thank you very much for the, for the great talk. It was fascinating. Um, I've got three questions, or possibly more, maybe the easiest first. Um, are, there, um, are there any software packages that uh, one can use sort of, that are ready to use for this? So here in my reference list, here are a couple of pointers to software packages. So there are some that are a little gnarly to install. They are not as user-friendly <laughs> as deep learning methods now. But um, so here, here, here's a short list. And also this first reference is this um, comparison, uh, the literature review. And so there are other pointers to other packages that are not listed in my reference list. So yes, that's those other pointers, yeah. Great, thanks very much. And um, second question is, um, how do these methods perform when your data is noise contaminated? Do they survive? That's a great question. Yes, so there's actually in this uh, in this uh, review article, they do have a um, comparison of uh, with respect to this noise parameter. So they they basically um, try to uh, they build some target functions, and then they add artificially some uh, noise and compare the performance and see whether the true formula exactly matches. Um, the, the formula uh, that was found by algorithms. And this degrades extremely quickly with the uh, amount of noise that you add to it. So in general, um, symbolic regression people, because there's mostly people from material science or biology are okay with identifying a good fit to the data, which would be measured by, R, by the variance explained or R squared or something like this. And um, they are often less con uh, concerned with finding an exact fit to a potential un unknown function, if that makes sense. Sure. So, but, but, but in artificial settings, uh, you can measure this, obviously, because you know the underlying formula. And, but like empirically, it is that it, this finding the exact match degrades very quickly with the noise parameters. Yeah. Sure, but maybe even worse that it's like if you have too much noise on it, you might have several models that would give you the same loss function, right, roughly? Absolutely, this happens all the time. Yes, the, the problem becomes very quickly, in a sense, unidentifiable, right? Um, so, and so then you have to make a choice. You have, a, you, as in many ill-posed problems, you, there are many solutions that look uh, differently, but they have the same performance. That, that will quickly uh, arise, absolutely. This might be a completely silly idea, but I mean, you, you mentioned the, the Feynman lectures and you want this kind of your search heuristics. Can't you just scan Feynman, you know, all the lecture notes, take all the uh, combinations of, you know, polynomial sign and whatever, and then look for the frequency of certain combinations, you know, that the sign, you know, hardly ever you have sign of square root of an exponential or whatever. Um, so to help you, guiding like do this uh, tree search is, is that possible or so, like? yeah so that that's a fantastic point so the uh the third um reference here in my reference list is doing something like it in a very weak form 
it counts um, the occurrence of primitive functions in an automatically extracted set of functions from uh, some online database and then weighs them um, uh, with respect to their occurrence and then prefer preferentially searches in the search tree based on the ones that occur more often. But it's in a it's weak in a in a sense that it doesn't it only looks at the um, frequency of terms and not at, for example at the combinations for example like you would very rarely find a power tower right in in a in a meaningful formula x plus x plus x that's just like a very ill behaved function but if you only look at the um, marginal occurrence of x, this would look very likely, but you have to some, somehow know that x of x is an unlikely combination. This is this paper does not address this. The fourth paper that I uh, mentioned here in the references has potentially the power of addressing this because they score a uh, partial formula really with respect to the exact formula, and not only the occurrence of the um, the marginal occurrence of the constituents. So, but uh, they, there's a shortcoming of this that it actually does not use real world data sets of equations to learn from, but things they generate themselves. But I, so it would be possible what you suggest, and that would be very, uh, yeah, that, that would be a great idea actually to combine these. Okay, thanks. And, uh, maybe one more crazy idea. Um, so let's say we have data sets that um, are exact, but that come, so I, I'm, I'm interested in dynamical systems, kind of, you know, finding, finding like, yeah. you know, the, the right-hand side of an ODE, but let's say it's an SDE. So there's a, there's a stochastic mm -hmm. force term in it. Is there any way of incorporating stochastic terms as well? That, so you, you can probably check, okay, I'm gonna make this error or something. So you can get some kind of estimate of an uncertainty and maybe you can translate that into, you know, a variance of the noise or something if you, I, I don't know. I, it's just a I, out of the blue question. No, this is the, this is this goes at the heart of many many problems in machine learning. This is absolutely this is a fantastic question. So, uh, and let me reformulate that. Essentially, the question is equivalent to saying a formula that I have now is not gives doesn't give you a, a deterministic output, but it's a distribution over outputs essentially. Yep. And now you have a, you want to score that against a particular, um, right? You op only observe one data set essentially, or one data point in, in, a, in a sense. And so now you, what you need to do is you need to score this, the true data under this uh, probabilistic model that is described by now your non-deterministic formula. And so there's a field called probabilistic programming where they exactly do that, where they allow for your formula to have kind of like stochastic decisions like in SDEs in them. And now the, the way you evaluate the fit, the fit of this model against some data is not now in terms of mean square error, but in terms of like log probability of explaining the data under this mm -hmm. probabilistic model that is defined by your formula. So that's a, that's, that can, this scoring in itself can be a very complicated um, procedure. It can be easy or not. For example, if you have a, if you have just a, a diffusion um, with Gaussian innovations, then you can. Then this is very easy to score. But if you have more complicated probabilistic models, it's actually a difficult problem to score the data under your proposed model. Um, but this is something that people look into. But I. But that's technically just very, very difficult to do. And so that's ongoing research, I would say. Yeah. Okay, great. Thanks. And can, can they deal with high, like also only with sort of low dimensional um, problems or can they deal with it? Very, very much so. Very much so. So there are certain high dimensional problems that are structurally low dimensional where this also works. Mm -hmm. So, for example, you could look at, uh, so probabilistic programming, people um, look, for example, at, at mixture models. So they try to mm -hmm. describe some data as a mixture of underlying components. And if the components have some low dimensional structure to them, then this problem becomes tractable again, although the problem in itself looks high dimensional. But yeah, there's a, there's a very strong cutoff with it, kind of with respect to the intrinsic complexity of the problem that it, that it becomes tractable because you ask like, 
extremely ambitious uh, questions uh, uh, to the system, essentially. Thank you very much. That was, that was very good. Yeah. Thanks for the questions. They were spot on. So um, if there's no further questions, let's thank Lars again. Thank you so much for the invitation.